Salutations. The end is well nigh. Michael Knowles, Candace Owens, Ben Shapiro, and so many other big names realize this and are writing about this at remarkable speed. What is at stake is the very essence of what it is to be human, faith and devotion to something beyond yourself, whether that be God or the United States of America, the meaningfulness which comes from that faith, and ultimately the roots of Western-defined civilization itself. Truth is under colossal threat, but thankfully, more and lesser known figures are increasingly getting on board. They can see that there's something amiss within the critical context and culture we live in. YouTubers are one such group, from the likes of Kimi Katiti, Ariel Scarcella, Amanda Ensing, or Ali Bear Stuckey, who represent only a handful of the diverse and thoroughly engaging takes that go against the grain of the culture. I am sorry to disappoint you, but this video is not a leftist argument or crusade against the right. This is not me saying that the old right is wrong about critical theory, because the left is right about critical theory. This is me saying that the alt-right is wrong about critical theory because it has exactly the same problem as it purports the left and liberals to have. It is a cult. No cult believes that it is a cult. And what the right has, which the left doesn't, is history. But this is a very particular history, which has been and will likely be to its advantage. This is what this video is about. To be a leftist means to commit yourself to an obsession with death. There's a small percentage of us that have conservative values. That means we are the minority. Democrat leadership is committed to a different kind of death. They are committed to the death of our society. We are countercultural. We are radical. And we can make a difference just by existing. They are committed to the death of individualism. And they are ultimately committed to the death to freedom. What do you have today on campus? You have critical theory is something that it has, has you know, infiltrated every faculty. We know this because Karl Marx wrote the book on it. And it seems now the Democrats in this country are performing a play on it. What they are after is obviously a totalitarian state, to put it in Star Wars terms. I think God is raising voices all over this nation, all over the world for his truth. And he's raising an army of people that have themselves wrapped in the armor of God. And it's beautiful to see unlimited power. The whole purpose is in order for you to be a member of the elect, a member of the political and intellectual elite. You have to buy into a system. It is all about social virtue signaling. And they hope that by bullying you into silence and feel and making you feel shame for your own race and making you feel shame for your own systems and making you feel shame for America, and they can shut you up and then take over the institution. And what's happening right now is that that vast middle is saying no. A moral panic is in full swing on almost every point of the modern political spectrum. I wasn't terribly surprised when Shapiro and other particularly right-wing and liberal commentators began a sort of crusade against critical theory, most notably critical theory. Critical theory has accumulated a number of critics, most notably from the right-wing or from a very Republican objective and standpoint, but also increasingly from seemingly liberal commentators and individuals. This is especially noticeable, I think, with the advent of identity politics and its greatest sway over the mainstream narrative. So I recently read an article by academic Ibrahim X. Kendi, and he wrote a very interesting piece in The Atlantic, which ultimately tried to explain why the right with regard to critical theory is more intent on not identifying a divide or not intent on trying to necessarily rectify a divide in the quote unquote culture wars, but is more so intent on in fact creating a divide in order to advance its own political agenda. Basically, modern American culture and society is not divided. It is, however, being divided, according to Kendi. In his article, Kendi writes the following. It doesn't matter that I consistently challenge Manichaean racial visions of inherently good or evil people or policymaking. It doesn't matter that I don't write about policymaking being good or evil, or that I write about the equitable or inequitable outcome of policies. It doesn't matter that I've urged us toward relative equity and not toward perfect equity. Here, here is Ibram Kendi. Ibram Kendi is the most famous one of these race hustlers probably in the country today. 
Here he is on CBS News calling all whites. I mean, as, as Robin, you know, talked about, it, 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 it is critical for, for white people, for people uh, in general, to, to stop denying their, their ideas, to stop denying the ways in which policies have benefited them, to stop denying them, and to realize that actually the heartbeat of itself is denial and the sound of that heartbeat is I'm not yes Kendi and Robin D'Angelo the author of the infamous white fragility self-help book which I am personally not a fan of may agree on some things but in their respective politics and interpretation of race the two are stark opposites for D'Angelo only white people can be racist for Kendi, however, people in general, irrespective of skin colour or socio-economic background, can be racist. This is stated clearly in his book and more so memoir, How to Be an Anti-Racist. They have first redefined racism such that black people cannot be racist uh, by their new definition. So they'll say racism is racial hatred combined with power. And they define power as only being held by white people. So they're by definition, then black people can't be racist. This was one of the innovations of this guy, Ibram Kendi, who is a total huckster. He's a pseudo academic who has fake degrees in fake discipline. I guess they're real degrees in fake academic disciplines, who has become very wealthy and very prominent by selling this lie. If you admit that you're a racist, you're a racist. But if you do not admit that you're a racist, then you're definitely a racist. A 2019 New Yorker piece analyzes Kendi's book most accurately, in my opinion. Throughout the book, the idea is to judge unfair policies while refusing to judge as a group the people who are subjected to them. Kendi believes that individual blacks have suffered trauma in America, but he rejects the racist idea that blacks are a traumatized people. To conflate Kendi and the more radical elements of the BLM movement, for instance, is erroneous and highly misleading if we go on what Michael Knowles and Candace Owens have to say. He, that is Kendi, wants readers to become politically active, to change public policy and to focus on power instead of people. D'Angelo is unapologetically interested in people, particularly white people. Kendi wants us to see not only that there is nothing wrong with black people, but that there is likewise nothing wrong with white people. There is nothing right or wrong with any racial groups, he writes. This is the bittersweet message hidden in his book, that in the grand racial drama of America, every group is already doing the best it can. The reason I am pointing out these inconsistencies is not to defend Kendi's righteous claims against those with only ill intent. No, I don't believe they have ill intent beyond trying to make book sales, which all of them are trying to do at the end of the day. They genuinely believe what they preach. They genuinely believe their interpretations, akin to how I genuinely believe my interpretation of Kendi. The difference is that I have no vested interest beyond myself, which Kendi's critics most definitely do. They have a culture, its traditions and mores to protect. They have a country to save from an enemy disguised as a race hustler. I want to emphasize how this conflation, simplification and, in Kendi's words, creation of divides is inevitable. And it is, quite frankly, politics in motion. The rhetoric on this side is one-sided, and I agree wholeheartedly with Kendi on this. However, I see this as inevitable, and I see this as ultimately what happens in the situation of politics. According to these critics of critical theory, incredibly meta, I know, they hold the following in common. Firstly, individuals are judged according to set monolithic criteria, largely beyond their control, such as, for instance, their skin color, their sexuality. Judgment based on this criteria means judgment in everything, in every facet and aspect of life. This leads on to the second common feature of critical theory identified by these critics of critical theory, namely that structural inequalities are everywhere and that they cannot be overcome, particularly in a context in which these institutions and structures founded on inequality still prevail Inequalities and injustices committed at the individual and micro level are merely reflections of the greater structural and institutional inequalities within society. 
Thirdly, these structural inequalities represent a dichotomy, a conflictual dichotomy between the oppressed and the oppressor. This dichotomy will inevitably be rectified dialectically, this is where Marxism features, by the oppressed overcoming their oppressors. Fourthly, this third point is achieved via countering the influence, the sway and the historical tradition at play. It means countering so-called truths or the truth, the American notion of exceptionalism, the American dream, the American values at the core of the US Constitution and Bill of Rights. In essence, it means countering the influence that the oppressor has had over the founding institutions of American politics, governance, and legality. There is a kind of obscuritism here, and this is my fifth and final point. A minority has put forth its agenda via critical theory, manipulating the popular faith and the popular political traditions in order to advance its own agenda and objectives. In this lies, for example, a form of censorship, a form of platforming and deplatforming individuals if their opinions do not align with that of this now mainstream narrative. How these critics of critical theory perceive critical theory leaves no room for the nuance and complex nature of what many of the most thoughtful and advanced among them are trying to argue. Kendi's arguments around policy, and not people as his critics constantly assert, is especially interesting. I would like to use the example of the introduction of the poll tax in the United Kingdom in the late 1980s. It represents how a seemingly neutral policy can be anything but and how, via critique, its true implications and consequences were identified, and rightly so. The government is about to tear up the present system of domestic rates and replace it with a fairer one. A policy, for instance, may have good, positive and equitable intentions, and I would not dispute that the vast percentage of legislation enforced and upheld in modern liberal democracies has such esteemable intent. It has been specifically designed so that the same level of services at the same degree of efficiency will result in the same community charge all over the country. However, it is perfectly reasonable to critique even the most equitable and well-intended policies when the outcomes don't reflect at least a convincing degree of the equity, prosperity and good which their enforcement asserted it would. This division is being created by a right and, in some cases, liberal press and pundits who are intent on formulating their own definition of critical theory, most notably critical race theory. In being completely diluted of its intricacies, its complexities, its multifaceted meanings and interpretations by different members of the ethnic black community, of society in general and of different academic schools in different times and points in history, this narrative has simplified critical theory into a definition which is incredibly universal and not necessarily true to the roots or significance of what critical theory is. Its core tenets have been standardized for an audience which is increasingly trying to navigate itself through a very ambiguous political landscape. There is, for instance, a stark difference between how the Black Hammer organization interprets and utilizes critical race theory relative to how Ibrahim Kendi himself utilizes and defines it and understands it. My intent in this video is to understand that political landscape more so than it is to say that one side of this debate is wrong relative to the other side. I'm interested in what all parties have to say and what I can see is something which in my opinion at least shows that Ben Shapiro and co are wrong about critical theory. They are wrong about it because they start from a particular truth which they have formulated and they see this truth 
as being unquestionable. They don't even question the foundations of where they start from. And I think it is important to look at that, particularly with the commentators and pundits which I am going to be referencing throughout this video. Critical theory similarly incorporates various generations of critical theorists, all responding to their specific context and evidently heavily aligned to Marxism. This is due precisely to the relatively greater prevalence of political ideologies such as communism in the immediate lives of Europeans from the early to mid 20th century. Marxism and communism are not just monolithic ideologies floating in space. They are particular to a context in history and to a people. The Marxian tenets of the Frankfurt School in the early 1920s and 1930s on to the 1950s were very specific to a context in Europe in which political ideology was pretty sacrosanct. There were conflicts between all ideological positions, most notably the dominant ones of communism, national socialism and liberalism. In 1920s Germany, the Weimar Republic was in full swing. It was not yet at its golden age, but it nonetheless was a society in which there was a liberal structure, a liberal basis, but this provided the space and the means for dominant, very fundamentalist ideologies to flourish and to conflict with each other, most notably communism and far right-wing, borderline and eventually national socialist ideologies. So something which is knowingly or otherwise completely dismissed by the right regarding critical theory in the context of the Frankfurt School is something that doesn't have anything necessarily to do with Marxism or communism or such threats to the world. If we relocate from Frankfurt to Berlin, we can see another institute being founded in 1919, and that was the Institute for Sexual Wissenschaft, or the Institute for the Study or Science of Sexuality. This institute was founded by, in my opinion, one of history's most phenomenal intellectuals and scientists called Magnus Hirschfeld. Hirschfeld was largely clouded out by the significance and renowned and dominance of Sigmund Freud at the time. However, he still had a considerable influence and made his mark across the world, particularly across Europe and the more progressive leaning universities in the United States. He was known as the Einstein of sex and for good reason. Hirschfeld spent the majority of his career and working life trying to decriminalize homosexuality in Germany. Now, Hirschfeld was rather phenomenal for his time, although outwardly he looked like quite an ordinary, stodgy academic. He was anything but. He was a homosexual, he was openly gay. His first exposure to his sexuality was when he had travelled to Chicago after he finished his studies and joined the gay scene there. And this influenced him greatly in terms of wanting to discover what his sexuality was and also what it meant to other people. In his spare time, he was a drag queen and he went under the name Tante Magnesia. He lived on the top floor of his institute with his lover and protégé, Li Xiaotong. Now something interesting about Li Xiaotong is his heritage. This incredibly clever young man was the son of one of Hong Kong's most wealthy businessmen, Li Kam Tong. This was a particular time in mainland Chinese and Hong Kongese history. During this time, the so-called New Cultural Movement and later May 4th Anti-Imperialist Movement were well underway. It emphasized a critical approach to Chinese traditions, which in no way dismissed them, but rather reinterpreted them alongside notions of freedom, democracy, and science. This movement originated out of student protests. It also reinterpreted male same-sex relationships, creating more tolerance around them. Li Xiaotong's father, for instance, gave Magnus and his son his blessing before the latter left home with his lover. 
Hello, so just a little gobbit for me whilst editing. On this section where I'm talking about the new cultural movement uh, in China, I find it very interesting that this inevitably is an example of a critical theory, a critical approach to life. And it in no way has any association, and in no way had any association to communism or to Marxism. So it's interesting to look at how critical theory is is not just this Marxian or communist conspiracy. It's very nuanced. It's so particular to times and to contexts. And actually, the white terror in China completely decimated the rise of this movement. Communism in no way affiliated itself with this movement in China. So again, nuance, and it's quite important to remember these things. Anyway, back to the video, apologies. And not only was his institute the first modern research institute for sexuality, it also contained the world's first and most extensive library dedicated to the study of sexuality. It housed the first museum, at least in the modern world, dedicated to sexuality as seen and practiced around the world and it was also the place where the term homosexual and the term transsexual was first used, defined and standardized. The institute was not just a place for academic study and research, it was also a safe haven for many deviants and individuals who had otherwise been ostracized by their family and society in general. The institute offered free and cheap housing and a accommodation to individuals in need. Walter Benjamin himself lived at the institution for a considerable time. Hirschfeld both wrote and starred in the groundbreaking 1919 silent film Different From The Others, which plot encouraged doctors to not repress their patient's sexuality, but to help them accept it and not feel shame toward it. The first transsexual surgery, male to female surgery, was undertaken at the institute. Gay and lesbian periodicals and magazines were rife, cross-dressing was the norm of Berlin's hedonistic nightlife, and a transvestite beauty pageant featured quite prominently. Germany was a bit of a moral void during this time, and ideologies and thought and intellectual deviance were able to inevitably flourish. I feel that this mirrors, quite interestingly, the times in which we live in today within modern Western societies primarily. The culture war of Germany in the 1920s has much in common with the culture war which we see today within our own societies. This mirrors insofar as the divisions, the moral panics and the claims to truth are concerned. Hirschfeld's institute was closed down in 1933. His library of some 20,000 books on sexuality across the globe destroyed and publicly burnt, and his museum confiscated. Decades of efforts to recognize the complexities of sexuality were erased in a matter of days. In this context of Germany in the 1920s and 1930s, in which critical theory was initially founded, I would like to make reference to a political theorist who I think, in fact, coincidentally, defines politics and the meaning of politics in a very interesting way that corresponds and correlates to why I have a problem with Shapiro and Co's interpretation of critical theory, and that is Carl Schmitt. So, Carl Schmitt was a German political theorist, jurist, and national socialist. His idiosyncratic, conservative theorizing has garnered him a massive following, mainly of political theorists intrigued by his notion of what politics is, and also his personal political beliefs in the context of Germany in the 1930s and 40s. Following the war, he was isolated from academic life almost entirely. 
his unrepentant and unashamed political allegiances have something almost in common with the crusade being launched by these right-wing and liberal pundits. When I say crusade, I am not exaggerating in any way. Many of these pundits and commentators believe themselves to be on a mission, a God-given mission, which justifies them speaking out and which gives them a sense of duty in doing so. Many right-wing political pundits and commentators, particularly those informed by the Judeo-Christian tradition, see themselves as necessarily countering the culture, necessarily countering the mainstream media and the mainstream narrative, which is increasingly being swept up in the wave of critical theory. The reason I reference Schmidt is because, firstly, as I said, he was living in Germany during the rise of the Frankfurt School, the infamous Frankfurt School at the foundation of critical theory itself, and he responded to it and to ideology in a very, very void-like Germany, where there was no real direction following the First World War. It was in 1932, during the initial rise of National Socialism in Germany, that Schmidt put forward a very all-encompassing and intriguing definition of the political or of politics. Every religious, moral, economic, ethical or other antithesis transforms into a political one if it is sufficiently strong enough to group human beings effectively according to friend and enemy. The political does not reside in the battle itself, but in the mode of behaviour which is determined by this possibility. By clearly evaluating the concrete situation, and thereby being able to distinguish correctly the real friend and the real enemy. A religious community which wages wars against members of other religious communities, or engages in other wars, is already more than a religious community. It is a political entity. So, in short, reduced to its basic definition and its existential form, the political or any form of action or activity tasked with decision-making activities or tasked with negotiating and understanding the relationship between individuals and groups in society, sufficiently groups individuals consciously or otherwise, into friend and enemy dichotomies. For Schmidt, war is not just in its literal sense, it's not just going rogue on your neighbours, it does also mean it in its figurative sense, more so in the possibility of waging war. Therefore, in its most dramatic form, if God knows, something happened in which actual physical violence and war was necessary between these two factions. This cultural war could indeed become an actual war for the culture. Basically, even somebody like myself who is apolitical is in essence political. The enemy is anything which is political particularly rigid grand narratives. One of these narratives is liberalism, which purports to be politically neutral. Liberalism claims, at its essence, to be able to extract warlike inclinations from politics. It is the key to undermining conflict in politics and all forms of antagonism. Multiculturalism, socio-religious tolerance, secularism and global politics with its universal agenda of establishing world peace via a world politics. This is all liberalism, at least modern liberalism, and it takes these and replaces the likes of nationalism, socio-religious homogeneity and theocracy, and national sovereignty over global governance. It is via multiculturalism, cosmopolitanism, socio-religious tolerance, secularism, and obviously global governance in the form of world peace and of international institutions and international political economy, which creates and is at the forefront of globalization, that liberalism can prevail and ultimately political neutrality, peace, global peace, and the increased quality of life can prevail and be the doctrine of the day. 
For Schmidt, liberalism is just as political, is just as willing to identify a friend and an enemy, particularly an enemy, as any grand narrative, as any political stance is. Liberalism is just as political as any other ideology, as any other politics. It is not neutral in any shape or form. A pure example of this would be the war on terror or even the war on drugs waged by liberal societies and liberal ideology. I'd equate the likes of Ben and Co to this liberal standpoint insofar as they start from a standpoint in which they believe themselves to be on the side or on the right side of American history. They believe to hold the truth and that they are waging their crusade in support, in defense of this truth. Due to a tradition of this standpoint being relatively unchallenged, or at least not challenged in a way that meaningfully and actually existentially threatened it, this standpoint has not been seen as political and valuable in and of itself. It is not seen to have enemies or to have friends. It's seen to be almost neutral and universal. If anything, Ben Shapiro needs critical theory in as much as critics need Ben Shapiro. In politics, everybody needs an enemy to give their beliefs and interpretations the meaning and purpose which drives communities, societies and individuals themselves forward. The only difference is that for the first time in modern history, the critics are seemingly gaining more power and holding more sway. For the likes of Ben Shapiro, Ted Cruz, Michael Knowles and Candace Owens, they are up against a contemporary take on what I would term obscurantism, namely the practice or policy of deliberately making something vague and difficult to understand, especially in order to prevent people from finding out the truth. This is seemingly with the objective of hindering attempts at further inquiry and query. In an introduction to their critical reader about the foundations of critical theory, authors Bronner and Kellner wrote the following. Fundamentally inspired by the dialectical tradition of Hegel and Marx, critical theory is intrinsically open to development and revision. Inherently self-critical, it offers a well-articulated standpoint for thematizing social reality. Unlike the current postmodern theories, which attack all forms of thought in an undifferentiated manner, Against all relativistic and nihilistic excesses, critical theory seeks an emancipatory alternative to the existing order. There are a multitude of thinkers in this respect who differ in their interpretations and critique the theory itself continually. This is about constant revision and critique, and this has become even more so the case in an internet age in which everybody has access to information, everybody's interpreting that information, and everybody is putting forward their perspective of their interpretation of a prior interpretation, and so have you, and whatever. For ease and simplicity of argument, it is understandable and makes perfect sense why Ben and Co would not go into the complexities and the depths of what critical theory is, its history and how it has morphed over time. Every political enemy has to be simplified and identifiable to an audience in order to garner enough support for it. Thus, critical theory is synonymous to Marxism, to communism and totalitarianism. It is associated with BLM, with the transgender agenda, with the indoctrination of society's prized asset and most innocent victims, children. On the other hand, proponents of critical theory have themselves simplified these individuals, these multifaceted individuals of right-wing and liberal thinkers into a simple enemy. One of the reasons why I see the likes of Ben Shapiro and co as merely defending an alternative set of beliefs, myths and religious doctrines or dictates, as opposed to some higher truth, is because of what can be seen as their common enemy. This enemy is communism. And what I see in this is something which is not often overtly detailed in the media. That is, communism's ideological commitment to state atheism. 
Ideologically and in practice, communism strives toward anti-religion. According to the World Population Review, only 10% of Americans identify as atheist. Yet simultaneously, the number of Americans identifying as Christian is at an all-time historical low. 40% of 18 to 29 year old Americans claim that they are atheists and 37% of 30 to 47 year olds identify as atheist. This, according to the World Population Review, has been attributed to an increased exposure to diverse perspectives in multicultural societies, which challenges the claim of any one particular viewpoint. Millennials and Gen Z are the most racially, ethnically and religiously diverse generation in the United States. Again, what this represents is the demise of previously institutionalized and organized religion. What this does not represent, very key here, what this does not represent is the demise of religious faith in and of itself. The void left by the demise of organized religion has permitted particular groups, particularly the younger, more claiming to be atheist younger generations, a place in which to find other forms of meaning and purpose, no longer given them by an organized religious authority. With reference to the American British commentator, right-wing commentator Andrew Sullivan, I would hazard that American religion and society is a practice and not a theory, a way of life that gives meaning a meaning that cannot really be defended without recourse to some transcendental value, underlying truth or God or gods. In watching the content of all the above mentioned political commentators, it is clear that truth is integral to their position and their argument, and that truth is being threatened, is being undermined by the political and critical thinking. But what is this truth? Truth is apparently factual, indisputable, and universal. And I'm gonna be real, if the truth offends you, then perhaps you're living in a lie. Truth does not care about your feelings. Truth does not have an agenda. And people who are spreading truth and searching for truth, they are just being persecuted right now in so many ways. And it's like, they didn't make up the truth, you know? The truth just is, it's the truth. It doesn't matter if you agree with it. It doesn't matter if you like it. And the sooner you realize that, the better you're gonna be off in life. I spent my high school years in South Africa and during the time in South Africa, I learned a lot about Nelson Mandela. I was in school in South Africa through the late 2000s and it was still healing. So there was a lot of discussion about race. They had a truth and reconciliation commission, but not only that, they just adopted fr a framework that aids forgiveness. I found the example of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission used by Kimi very interesting. Yes, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was all very well and good in the immediate and quite idealistic post-apartheid era. Apartheid ended in 1994. It is now 2021 and South Africans are angry. Truth, I would strongly argue, has not set South Africans free because not much promised in those initial post-apartheid years has noticeably come to fruition. The issue in both South Africa and our modern context is that the universality which truth depends on for its validity no longer exists without question. This clearly shows how such claims to truth are just the fundamentalist principles and values of those making the claim. But what this comes down to is a clash. It is a clash between various political and religious creeds who have labelled the other as the enemy in order to garner followers and ultimately meaningfulness and purpose in a modern world increasingly beyond our grasp. Globalisation and world politics, advanced by modern societies with the United States at the forefront, does not have the mythology, the storytelling and emotive sense of a nation's founding and destiny which nationalism has. Manifest Destiny, US Exceptionalism and the American Dream, all of these embody this religiosity and in all cases of patriotism or nationalism, an irrational allegiance to a land, its institutions and millions of citizens whom in our day-to-day -day lives we either don't engage with or care at all about. This, at its core, is faith. It is hope and it is religion. 
This is, in essence, politics. I feel that Andrew Sullivan best sums this up. Seduced by scientism, distracted by materialism, insulated like no humans before us from the vicissitudes of sickness and the ubiquity of early death, the post-Christian West believes instead in something we have called progress, a gradual ascent of mankind toward reason, peace and prosperity as a substitute in many ways for our previous monotheism. We have constructed a capitalist system that turns individual selfishness into a collective asset and showers us with earthly goods. We have leveraged science for our own health and comfort, our ability to extend this material bonanza to more and more people is how we define progress, and progress is what we call meaning. In this respect, Steven Pinker is one of the most religious writers I've ever admired. His faith in reason is as complete as any fundamentalist belief in God. But none of this material progress beckons humans to a way of life beyond mere satisfaction of our wants and our needs. And this matters. We are a meaning-seeking species. And we will find meaning, whether it be in creating enemies, simplifying and reducing concepts and individuals, or creating and finding symbols. What I have said in this video makes no difference to these various political divides. And what they say makes no difference to me either. Meaning doesn't need reason or a chronological history of the complexities underlying critical theory. Unfortunately, Ben and friends are fueling imaginary flames for book sales, but more so for a nostalgic faith and hope that we most definitely are not going to return to. There is no making America or any modern society great again, for instance, akin to how there is no making of any human utopia. There is nothing unique or special about our time in history. We are just living in Weimar cultural liberalism, the remake. Fortunately, we have not just emerged from a world war or found ourselves with a relatively low quality of life. There are always going to be friends and enemies. And with everything political, sometimes it's best not to take our enemies so seriously and personally. Sometimes it's best not to take ourselves so seriously. Culture wars need not translate into real wars. It is critique, not liberalism that can make the former stimulating without leading us blindly into the latter. Thank you so very much for watching this video. Please subscribe and leave your thoughts, your comments, your criticisms or what have you down below. And also if you have Twitter or like to use Twitter, feel free to follow me there. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.